Good afternoon. My name is Christopher Miller, Senior Director of Education and Community Engagement here at the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center. Welcome and thanks for joining us for this meaningful discussion. If you are a member, thank you for your membership. If not, please consider becoming a member. For more details about membership at the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center, visit freedomcenter.org. Here at the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center, we have an outstanding permanent exhibit, in, in, Invisible Slavery Today. It's the world's first museum quality permanent exhibit about modern day slavery and human trafficking. The exhibition explores the causes of slavery, the economic forces that have contributed to its growth and the response of government, the justice system and the public. We also have a website dedicated to this work, In Slavery Now. In Slavery Now is a project of the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center where you can learn, connect, and act. Learn about today's forms of slavery and abolition, connect with anti-slavery and anti-human trafficking organizations, and review the 425 actions you can take now. This conversation along with our website and as well as our exhibits magnify a greater awareness to end human trafficking today. We have a wonderful panel that is before us, but our panel will be moderated by a very good colleague of mine. Our discussion will be moderated by Dr. Jackie Hudson. Uh, she holds a PhD in American Cultural Studies as well as a certificate in public history from Bowling Green State University. She joined us in August of 2021 and it's a pleasure to have her on our staff. So I will hand things over to Jackie to guide us through our conversation today. Thank you for joining us. Well, thank you, Chris. So hello everyone. And thank you for joining us today on the National Day of Human Trafficking Awareness. As Chris just said, my name is Dr. Jacqueline Hudson and I'm the Expositions Content Developer at the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center. And I will be the moderator of this, I'm pretty sure will be a wonderful informative webinar. Since 2010, the entire month of January has served as the National Human Trafficking and Slavery Awareness Month. During this month, we celebrate the efforts of governments, international organizations, anti-trafficking entities, law enforcement officials, survivor advocates, businesses, and private citizens all around the world to raise awareness about human trafficking. The National Underground Railroad Freedom Center and the End Slavery Now Project put us together this amazing panel to shine a little more light on this horrible crime. With that, let me introduce our panelists. Rashaya G is an attorney, educator, and racial equity expert who's been engaged in anti-racism work for over 10 years. Her formal education has included courses on civil rights, race, law, and social psychology, critical race theory, and an individualized advanced study on intersectionality. She also, she's also certified in workplace diversity, equity and inclusion, trauma responsive advocacy and race and cultural diversity in American life and history. She facilitates workshops, give lectures and operationalizes anti-racism commitments for organizations across the US and has been recognized by, normal, by numerous racial justice organizations for her efforts. She is distinguished in her knack for compelling oration, extensive preparation, and meaningful engagement. Our second panelist is Virgin Adelina Lian. <laughs> Virgin graduated from the University of Cincinnati College of Law and spent the majority of her law school career advocating for human rights and serving underprivileged people in the community. Virgin is an attorney with the Second Chance Project. She joined the Ohio Justice and Political, I mean, I'm sorry, and Policy Center in June 2018. She provides legal services, outreach, and education, specializing in the legal needs resulting from human trafficking and a variety of civil legal issues arising from victimization. Our last and final panelist is Gabby Baleas. 
has a doctorate of law in intercultural human rights focused on human trafficking, culture, law, and policy. Her education includes a master of law focused on intercultural human rights and international law and a business and a bachelor's of arts in theater studies communication. Gabby also just recently published her thesis, Eradicating Human Trafficking, Culture, Law, and Policy, which takes a look at the cultural elements that conflict with existing anti-human trafficking laws across three case studies in the United States, India, and Costa Rica. So now since we are um, have made the, the wonderful introductions, we're gonna start with the first question. So there are number, there are number estimates between 20 and 40 million people trapped in some form of trafficking. That's a big, pretty, that's a pretty big range. Why can it be more, why can it be difficult to see a survivor while others may see just a criminal? Anyone can start. I mean, I'll take a first stab and then <laughs> we can go out there, but I will talk first to the number because that's always a question that I get. You know, these are number one, astronomical, of course. Number two, something to really remember, these are estimates. So um, that are either reported or recorded. So the figure is likely to be much, much higher and really unknown, especially through this COVID crisis. Um, but just to give some background on that, the 40 million figure that we, we see, um, uh, sort of the bigger space, it does include child marriages, which adds a significant amount, almost half of that number. Um, and then the 20 plus million figure that we see, that's often quoted, um, comes from, I think, the International Labor Organization, which I did, they did in partnership with the WACP Foundation. <clears throat> and that includes, um, really focuses on, you know, forced labor. So want to, I think, add that background because it does, it does span quite a few, uh, a few numbers, um, you know, and in terms of, um, you know, looking at, at the crime or the hidden aspect of it, you know, um, I think if we, if we kind of take a, a little bit of a step back, I mean, it's, 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 it's hard to look at, um, first off, you know, the hidden nature of the crime, you know, it's um, nefarious in nature, of course, you know, um, and it really um, kind of looks at how it is actually um, challenges the rule of law, I think, first of all, you know, where it's attacking, you know, um, safety and freedom from everybody. And it's, it's I think, also perpetuating the, the culture of corruption, whereby we're almost allowing this, this, this crime to continue to happen, despite of the crimes that are that are in place. So, and you know, when we look at survivors versus you know a criminal, you know, some of these victims um, have been, um, you know, uh, let's say criminalized through the system, right? So um, they've been arrested and prosecuted for crimes that they have committed, perhaps even forced to doing so while being trafficked. So, out of you know situations or out of survival, um, there they may have even recruited others into the cycling, the cycle, sorry, of trafficking. Um, be it sex trafficking or other. Um, and I think, you know, we also have to look at what their journey has been. You know, they've experienced um, in their journey, prostitution, homelessness, begging, um, you know, a crossover to perhaps drug addiction, alcoholism. So they may face additional criminal charges along the way, um, you know, and in the, the context of, you know, um, you know, commercial sexual exploitation of children, you know, minors um, under 18, under the age of 18 are getting also arrested, processed, and convicted criminally for prostitution um, and related offenses, which is kind of inconsistent because the, the concept of, of consent should not even be, you know, of question when it comes to, to a minor. So, um, you know, and I think, you know, I, of course, I'll plug in for culture, how much of this sort of is enabled through culture that we hide the crime um, and really kind of point the finger at at these survivors um, as criminals. So, and I can, you know, go on and on, but I'll, I'll defer to really the attorneys who are, are sort of the experts in this related to cases. Yeah, I just wanna, I just wanna add this kind of, this idea that, um, you know, the narratives we tell ourselves about as a country, about who criminals are, right? About what, who can be victimized. 
uh, about what victims look like, right, all help to frame our ability to identify uh, uh, someone in trouble, someone that is worthy of resources and assistance, who's worthy of redemption, as opposed to someone who's worthy of punishment. Uh, that's all framed in part by the narratives that have been colored and animated by these kind of social constructions of class, of race, of gender, of gender identity, and so forth and so on, right? And so, uh, uh, and I, I certainly can talk about this a little bit more, but I think it's important for us to know that these identifications depend on our very human impulses to uh, categorize and to uh, label people in ways that are consistent with our pre-existing beliefs about, about those communities that these people emerge from. I can't tell you how many times I've encountered stuff like, oh, it's okay that, you know, that particular child is not going to school and instead of working, is working in, you know, agriculture, really intensive agriculture, like that's what they do, right? That's their culture, right? Um, uh, also, the other, the other piece of this is that a country whose founding is undergirded by this legacy of chattel slavery, that means we are uh, uh, desensitized to some extent to labor exploitation, right? We've accepted uh, exploitative labor practices as part of the necessity of how we grow and live as an economy. We've accepted this reality that, you know, low wage labor is essential for the growth of our uh, uh, economy. And so scholars have argued that our practice, our original practice of chattel slavery inured us to more exploitative labor practices such that it becomes difficult for us to uh, appreciate or be sensitive to how labor exploitation is problematic because it's such, a, I mean, you know, we think about how many of us know, you know, that there's these really kind of uh, extreme and problematic labor practices happening in prisons every day, right? And yet we are like, well, this is normal, right? This is okay. This is necessary. We depend on those goods. We depend on those those uh, 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 prisoners fighting fires and building roads and doing all the various things that they do. We've accepted this as part of a, a fact of life, even though it's clear to us that being paid, uh, you know, 10 cents a day, 20 cents a day to do jobs that are dangerous, that are, you know, backbreaking, uh, uh, we've accepted this as part of life. So anyway, I say all of that to say the ability to identify, to recognize someone uh, as being trafficked, to as, as someone who is being exploited for their labor uh, uh, is, is colored and animated by all of these other cultural dynamics that sometimes can seem unrelated or that we're not constantly aware of because they kind of operate at a, at a level beneath our awareness. They've just been normalized as part of our societal context. Uh, all of those become in become barriers, become impediments to our ability to accurately identify, recognize, name. Uh, and, um, you know, I often tell people that race is one of those constructs that is intended to disrupt our natural inclination to see ourselves in one another, right? As humans, if you see someone over there suffering, the, the impulse should be, OMG, this is a problem. Let me help, let me reach out, right? Let me extend myself. This could happen to me, right? But because of the ways in which race has created these barriers that allow us to say, this person isn't like me and their circumstances aren't, aren't my circumstances and they're more equipped to deal with this or handle it because it's their culture, because I believe some you know wild and crazy belief about their biology uh, uh, really, really impedes our ability to lend ourselves to one another, even in the context of human trafficking, so. Uh, I will uh, stop there. That, that was the perfect macro backdrop. We did not practice this, I promise. This is great. Uh, I wanted to bring it down more to a micro level of what I see with my clients that are in my office. So with having that backdrop, what I'm dealing with when I have a survivor in my client, in my office, they, they come to me more often than not. They're not in their trafficking situations anymore and they have this long criminal record that they've accumulated as a result of their victimization. So what brought them to my office was, I can't get a job, I can't get housing, I can't get my kids back. So more often than not, about 85 to 90% of my clients, they didn't come to my office even identifying themselves as a survivor of trafficking or knowing that what they experienced in their past was a crime in and of itself. Um, oftentimes the first time they've ever heard of the concept of human trafficking, especially applied to their experiences has been in my office, has been me asking as trauma informed as possible. Um, tell me more, um, what were these dynamics like, um, kind of what brought you in that situation? Where did this all start? Um, so it's, it's really difficult when you have that situation. I am not a social worker. I am not a therapist. I didn't go to school for that. 
Um, but to have these delicate conversations, knowing this backdrop in behind the scenes, um, to then look at these records and have some patterns, have some inclinations to start asking, well, what was that relationship like? How did you get involved? Um, and it's so difficult to rewire somebody's memories or look at somebody's life in a different angle, a different perspective, because there is this normalization of abuse. Um, many of my clients have said, well, my parents acted this way, or we've had personal relationships like this, that this was perfectly normal. I didn't know that what was going on was abusive, um, let alone domestic violence, let alone human trafficking. So when we're in these situations where we're on the grassroots level of helping people or trying to provide services, we are trying to normalize or work with people who have normalized situations like this. So how do we then go about uh, going to court and saying, here's a very unusual, abnormal situation uh, without fully alienating my clients or without totally rocking their worlds or their um, sense of self and identity. So um, I would say a big reason why this crime goes largely unnoticed or unidentified because survivors themselves may not know how to identify it. They may not know how to connect their experience to this very lofty phrase of human trafficking. It's, it, it, it's sometimes just not even as formal as that. So um, I think the more that we're able to educate of what things look like with different cultures, what's appropriate behavior, what's just abusive behavior, what, what are the foundations of vulnerability that people experience from childhood, if not earlier generationally, um, human trafficking is not a one and done crime. It's something that you have to look back on somebody's entire life to find clues until you're finally at that place where, okay, I'm piecing together 30 years of your life to be able to say, this is what happened to this person. And that's so difficult when they're in the heat of everything. So um, that is my micro level perspective on that question. And I think, you know, what you said, Regine, is about, you know, talking about the, the harms um, are done when we, we do criminalize the, uh, the survivors of this violence. You know, you're talking about how they, um, you know, they can't get a job, they can't, you know, can't take care of their kids or they get lose, you know, custody of their kids or they just can't function. Um, so I think that's a great way of, um, you know, uh, um, another layer of that. So, so yeah. Um, so yeah, so I'm going to, um, you know, uh, Rashaya did mention um, about uh, the subject of race. So I'm gonna to go to this next question that happened. So it says, it can happen to anyone, but the re reality, reality is that this crime also happens to black and brown girls. Can you talk about the intersection of human trafficking and race in America? Can you highlight the historical rele relevance that comes into play while talking about race and human trafficking in America? So Rashaya, I'm gonna start with you because this is your bread and butter. Yeah, um, uh, so first off, I didn't say this uh, earlier and I should have, uh, I, I really just want to um, uh, say how grateful I am to be invited to this discussion. Uh, and I really appreciate um, having the opportunity to bring my particular lens, which is the way in which race uh, uh, informs the anti-trafficking space uh, in the trafficking movement. And so um, um, I, I just really appreciate growing in consciousness. And yeah, you know, I'm gonna try not to look at my notes. <laughs> I wrote notes. Uh, I'm going to try not to look at them and then I'll just review it in case I missed anything. Yeah, so so, so I think it's really, really important and it's so difficult for us as a country uh, uh, because we just don't have a good cognitive infrastructure around the historicized trajectory of race in this country, right? Like we just, you know, it's, it's this really holy uh, uh, kind of historical collective memory. Like at some point there was slavery, then it was over. Then at some point MLK came and then that was over and we've been fine, right? Like ever since it's this really, really kind of botchy uh, history which makes it hard for us to appreciate and connect some of the modern um, phenomenon that we're experiencing to its historical origins. So in terms of race uh, and trafficking, it's really important to remember, to remember that the conflict about race has almost always been a conflict over labor, right? Almost always, right? Who has access to it? Who gets to control it? And and um, and and I, I know that the question specifically mentioned black and brown girls, but I want to be clear that when I talk about the uh, kind of intersection of race and labor exploitation, I am not only speaking about American chattel slavery, but about the various ways in which many, many, many racially marginalized groups have had their labor exploited. If you're thinking about uh, uh, 
Chinese laborers in the coolie trade, if you're thinking about the Bracero program, right? If you, I mean, it's just been kind of a historical um, cycle, if you will, of uh, racially marginalized groups having their labor exploited. In fact, I've made the argument that this country's foundational relationship with many of these racially marginalized groups has been a labor exploitation, right? That is the lens through which some of these groups are understood, right? That is the primary lens, is this lens of labor exploitation racial, racialized with, 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 I'm sorry, justified with race, right? Race as a device to control labor exploitation. Uh, and so uh, uh, the country as it exists today would not be possible without this intersection of race and labor exploitation. And I always emphasize that point because it's important for me to um, communicate that trafficking in humans was only really problematized very fairly recently, right, in American context. It, it is the foundation of our country in which it wasn't a problem. Not only was it not a problem, it was legitimized through law, through science, through religion, through the media and the press, right? It, it was really embraced. And we think about it specifically in the context of slavery, but even after slavery, if you think about black codes, there were black codes who said, uh, if you were a black man, the only job you could have was as a field hand, right? And if you refused to sign an employment contract, you could be prosecuted. And we could take your children from you and make them work, right? And these were laws, right? So you had the full weight of the state willing to enforce these norms, right? And you have to think about the value systems and the belief systems and the narratives that emerge from these practices, right? And so um, when we're thinking about uh, uh, America's existence, right? When we're thinking about, um, um, how we've evolved as a nation. It's really, really important to remember that, you know, without race and, and labor exploitation, it would not be possible. We would not exist as we do today, right? The wealth that was necessary for America to, um, uh, you know, decide to leave the British empire, right? To decide that we're done with the crown could only be possible through this race and labor exploitation. So I say all of that to say, in order for us to normalize that exploitation, right? In order for us to kind of reconcile this and, and address our, our, our own um, sense of, of disequilibrium that this would have caused, we needed to tell ourselves stories, right? We needed to tell ourselves narratives about why this was okay, right? Around who was actually a victim, right? Um, and, and I say that to say, or, or, or one of the ways that this is illustrated is we don't use the language of victimizations to talk about slavery in this country, right? We don't, we don't refer to the people who suffered and toiled under the institution of slavery as victims. We call them slaves. We call them enslaved people if we wanna use people first language, right? Uh, once they were freed, people who actually were able to survive, we called them freedmen. We've never used the language of victimization to refer to people who actually toiled. That's just not how we conceptualize them, right? Because acknowledging that they were victimized or that they experienced victimization would require us to confront their victimizers, right? And that's inconsistent with how we regarded those people historically throughout our narrative. So all of that to say that when we talk about who's able to access victimization, it's important to recognize that that access is racialized. Um, uh, I, I, I encourage people to put in the chat, but I'm certainly going to answer, right, who is the archetype of victim, right, in this country, right, outside of, you know, perhaps children, generally, we'd like to think, perhaps, right, but the archetype of victim in our society is white women, right, white females, I should say, right, white female bodies are the kind of bodies we are socialized into believing deserve protection, right, need to be protected, and we saw this manifesting in the, in the, um, in lynching campaigns, right? We see this in multiple spaces about who's a victim and who's not, right? We see this in the moral panic around critical race theory, right? Around which children we, whose comfort we have to protect, right? We see this in narratives when uh, uh, unarmed people are shot by the police, right? It's an immediate attempt to say, you know, what did this person do, right? How did they pose a threat? Were they scary, right? Around who can be a victim. And so we see this too within the anti-trafficking space because one of the things I also have to remind people is that the trafficking movement was created and evolved during this space, right? I mean, like it's not outside of this context. It is created within this context. It is shaped by this context. It does not like fly above it or somehow uh, 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 unrelated to it. Uh, and so um, uh, we see it manifesting in the messaging around uh, anti-trafficking, right? If you were to Google human trafficking and just look at images, almost all of the images you're going to see are of white females. 
right? And you're gonna see them bound almost explicitly, right? Like you're gonna see them with ropes and chains and hands across their mouths, sometimes and often, uh, and not even sometimes, hands of color, right? Um, uh, and so the messaging, if we look at the, the uh, victim bills and legislation that passes in states, it's often victim bills and legislation named after white females. Uh, and so all of this permeates and influences uh, um, the anti-trafficking space and influences who we recognize as victims and who can galvanize the societal consciousness and the societal resources into action. Like who, who can we mobilize on behalf of? And you saw this around campaigns. I know indigenous women are doing beautiful campaigns with red dresses right around indigenous women missing. Uh, we've heard about black women missing and, and not getting the same media attention, not getting the same uh, moral panic. Uh, uh, when uh, uh, Black women go missing. So I say all of that to say all of these things, our historical relationship with race, the way in which we've used uh, uh, that racialization to justify labor exploitation, the way in which these things have informed who we understand to be victims, who we understand to be worthy of uh, resources, worthy of protection, worthy of um, validation, right? all of that is informed by, by race. So. Uh, uh, it is not, oh, 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 also something else I was going to say, um, uh, the adultification bias, right, that happens to girls of color, especially Black girls, right, this idea that she's fast, she asked for this, she invited this, she's somehow more sexually advanced uh, and mature, uh, uh, and so it's something about her, her race, which transforms her into uh, someone who's able to consent, someone who's able to invite this and, and, and want this, right? All of those things are, are buttressed by our relationship with race that we as a country don't talk about authentically, don't talk about uh, enough, uh, and don't have that cognitive infrastructure, those language tools and that space to explore in ways that are helpful. That was a lot, uh, and I'm certainly happy to unpack some of that, but those are some of my initial thoughts. Uh, Gabby or Virginia, you wanna contributes? I just want to say you reminded me when I became your disciple. I love hearing you talk about this. And if you, if anyone hasn't heard Rishaya speak about this in full length, please do. That's all I'm going to say about that. So glad you reminded me how I came to this place. Yeah, it's tough to follow that. But, <laughs> um, you know, I, I will say that I think that's the thing. It's like we almost we tend to get so involved in what we're seeing in the media and a lot of the um, sort of theories that are out there right now that we kind of forget to pause and really look at what what human trafficking really looks like and you know break away from the imagery that were presented that was created by somebody right um and i think it's you know and the truth is it can happen to anyone and, and it includes everybody right so it, it could be any race any gender uh, people with dif uh, disabilities um you know but it really does look for um or i would say traffickers will really exploit those that have one ingredient and that's vulnerability and so we have to look at what is that and number one is is what you know Rashai was talking about inequalities including discrimination right so that includes very much at the top you know race um, and then again go down the list but we can look at you know economic or systemic disadvantages um, poverty xenophobia um, you know and I know Polaris put out some stats you know when you look at um, I think it's in Washington, King County, you know, it's like 84% of all the child sex trafficking victims are black girls, um, while they only make up like 7% of the general population. So um, there's a massive disproportion when you look and start to look at that. And you do have to look back historically to sort of move forward and look at what the actuality is, because um, we can just kind of look at anything that we have on social media and repurpose that, but pause to look and where is that coming from? Where's the data coming from? What is that narrative that you're pushing forward? Because I think it does matter in how we're gonna look at ourselves and how, for example, what I focus is on, you know, very, very closely to culture. What cultural attitudes, behavior, behaviors or beliefs are we perpetuating that's gonna do nothing more than to sort of hide the crime over and over and over from those who are who are actually you know affected by it. Awesome. So let's back up just a tad and talk about um, two main types of human trafficking: sex and labor. Sex trafficking often get a lot more attention and media coverage, but can you talk to us about labor trafficking both in the United States and globally? Globally. 
How are they similar and where are they different? So we're gonna start with you, Gabby. Let me find my unmute. Um, so thank you, so, <clears throat> again, a great question. I think, um, and going back to those numbers that we talked about in the beginning, you know, the, um, the 24.9 million um, that focuses on sort of um, 24.9 million people around, the world that are forced into um, into labor, you know, 16 million of that um, is in the private sector. So these are, um, you know, industries like construction, agriculture, and other industries. It includes domestic work, which is another very hidden aspect of the crime, um, and it includes child labor, which includes dead bondage, um, servitude by children, and there's you know specific um, examples I can give um, along those lines, um, and then you know let's say a subset of that would be, you know, 4 million uh, persons are in forced labor situations imposed by state authorities, and then 4.8 million um, are actually forced into sexual exploitation, which again, we're probably more familiar with. Um, but so we look at the labor part, it's pretty massive. And yet a lot of it is harder to, number one, detect, because um, I think Virginia was talking about it, you know, a lot of people don't even self-identify that they're labor trafficking, because labor environments really can blur the lines between exploitation and trafficking situations. Um, and then the fact that, again, it doesn't get the notoriety or the attention that it should have. Um, and a lot of these are sort of marginalized communities uh, who may be you know, bounded by lack of language, lack of knowledge of the law, what their self, even their self-worth, their dignity as a person. Um, so they kind of get out of need into these situations to begin with, right? Or they fall victims to it. Um, and traffickers, you know, really look to essentially exploit, like I said, you know, the inequalities within society to source that demand um, for forced labor. Um, you know, so while trafficking, um, you know, you mentioned the book, but this is kind of the, the, the essence of my dissertation, right? So where does culture enabling these things to happen? So we have laws in place and existing against labor trafficking, um, but there's an, 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 a culturally embedded element all over the world that continues to, to perpetuate the crime. You know, we see it within our global economy with outsourcing um, supply chains. And this has a direct link back to us, the consumer, in ways that we may not even be thinking about, right? So in terms of what we're constantly in demand for, cheaper products, um, services that in turn are fueling sort of this labor trafficking to happen. Um, so again, just looking at the cultural underpinnings um, that may exacerbate some of these situations where the traffickers are um, looking or, or, or you know, pinning down on these vulnerable groups that are dismissed by society, the ethnic minorities, the migrant workers, the indigenous people, um, individuals in, in poverty, they're much more likely to fall victim you know, of the crime. So to give examples, um, and you asked Jackie, you know, in, in, in the United States, in the context of the US, you know, labor traffic can include um, domestic servitude, which does not get a whole lot of airtime, um, and sectors you know, like agriculture, especially here in, in, in Florida, massage parlors, um, it also intersects in the context of temporary labor and the abuse that can happen within the actual recruiting process for this temp labor and, you know, with actual legal temp visas. So, um, uh, you know, we may often overlook and dismiss, you know, immigrants and foreign nationals as victims of, of, of the crime, you know, here in the U.S., because I think we perhaps, and I think, you know, Rashaya talked about, I think we may even react or we've been conditioned to react a bit more empathetically towards victims, you know, trafficking victims of a certain demographic or perhaps a, a, a typology of the crime, you know, outside of labor trafficking, when in fact, you know, again, it can affect anyone, right? Any race, gender, uh, age group that again is vulnerable to that to that trafficking. Um, and it can be, again, really, really hard to identify. So it doesn't it doesn't get the, the media coverage in general that, that it should. <clears throat> and bringing it sort of, in the context of India, for example, labor trafficking um, is very prevalent throughout the, the country, um, including child labor. Um, and there are practices um, such as, you know, dead bondage, which is very ingrained in the culture um, and perpetuates through generations, um, sadly, despite of laws being in place um, and cultural elements like, and th these are really tough um, conversations to have, like race in this country. Oh, you know, in India, we're talking about the caste system, which can sometimes overshadow, you know, a reality where the Dalits um, are often discriminated against, um, exploited, and remain, you know, the most vulnerable group within society to fall victims of, of forced labor. Bringing it, you know, maybe a little closer to here in Haiti, you know, the cultural practice of the Restavec. Um, it dilutes perhaps, you know, good intentions of, 
um, socioeconomically vulnerable um, biological families who, you know, want something better for a child and they willingly will present this child, um, you know, to a host family who may be better off financially in the hopes that the child will have a better future. But the reality behind that is that in that exchange, you know, for potential shores, you're now looking at a child that has been, you know, stripped of their dignity. They are, the situation often turns into domestic servitude, you know, including no school access, maybe denial of, you know, downtime as a child, um, proper nutrition, they're often isolated. And you look at, again, the underpinnings or the, the inequalities and the realities, right? So Haiti, and I think the last number I looked at I think is impacted by over 60% is uh, actually live under the poverty level. That's significant. And there's a, so there's a direct contact, you know, I mean, uh, a direct um, connection to that vulnerability um, that again goes unseen um, and a massive risk for, for labor trafficking really around the world. And depending on where we are, it may change a little bit, a little bit but um, I think it, it really just goes unnoticed. I, I, I challenge everybody, especially the people who are doing this work, um, to always identify that this information is not accessible and intuitive to everybody. Um, I'm, I'm hearing this and it, it makes perfect sense to me because I'm doing this work and I've educated myself about this work. But the biggest problem between labor trafficking and sex trafficking is not having access to even descriptors or the language or the perspective or the mindset to even be able to describe the experience or the phenomenon. Um, I, I can see that with my sex trafficking survivors, um, many are afraid to even describe their experiences because they've made mistakes along the way and they don't think that they're allowed to complain or to say that they've experienced something bad. Um, or if I'm talking about my labor trafficking survivors, um, they may say, well, my first mistake was I came to this country undocumented. Whatever happened to me, it's on me at that point. Um, mm -hmm. Not to mention factoring in it, all the patriarchal um, traditions or the way people feel about the roles of cis men, cis women, just all these gender roles that have to do with people's experiences. Um, I'm able to articulate it again because I have the privilege to be able to articulate it. But when I have clients who I don't even know how to explain or define this crime in a way that doesn't shock or disrupt their entire worldview, I think that's problematic. And that's something that adv advocates really need to think about and push forward. Um, we can't have the main source of education about human trafficking be from the media. Um, this is too complicated for that to be their role. It's, it's, it's too much, it's too complex. Um, so these webinars are so important. I love that we have these conversations every year, especially this time of year. Um, but I definitely do challenge for the sake of making this information more accessible, having community leaders, having people who, who understand the culture so deeply, um, start creating situations where we can start giving tools and words to the survivors who wanna help themselves first and foremost. I can do what I can do in the courtroom, but I am no one's savior. I am nobody's white knight, none of that. I am just a tool for my client, but we need to give more tools to survivors, regardless of what type of trafficking it is. I always encourage people to really um, seek out the ways in which so many of our social justice impulses are interrelated. I frequently tell people that anti-racism work is anti-trafficking work. And Gabby talked about this earlier when she talked about some of those vulnerabilities. If we think about what the vulnerabilities are for trafficking, right? Um, housing insecurity, right? Lack of access to gainful employment. All of these things are also things that are colored and animated by racial uh, uh, inequities, right? And so, you know, addressing some of the root causes of, of the trafficking vulnerabilities requires us to have a confrontation with why these conditions exist in the first place in our society that makes it so that some people are more vulnerable to trafficking situations than other people, why some people have these economic insecurities, why some people are in positions where, you know, they're likely to experience these harms or have more encounters with, with law enforcement, which then locks them out of or gets them less access to, uh, you know, legitimate or valid economies. Even if we think about the, the uh, phenomenon that Gabby described in Haiti, right? Haiti's poverty levels are what they are in part because of the history of Haiti, right? Because of the, the, the economic pressures and weights that have been placed on Haiti in part because of Haiti's history as, as uh, this country that's been born out of slave rebellion, right? And so uh, it's so important for us as people who are invested in this work, who wanna do this work to recognize the ways in which this work is informed by so many other societal dynamics. And it requires us to not just care about this one aspect of this, person life, this person's life. I was also thinking about what Virginia said earlier when she was talking about her clients 
Um, similarly, right, I have these clients who, um, you know, uh, will be trying to get their children back and you know they were for purposes of services they were a victim when they were in their trafficking situation but now that i'm trying to get their children back and i need the court to take acknowledgement of the way in which their trafficking situation has impacted their ability to parent right now they're not uh, regarded as a survivor or a victim anymore right now they're just a bad parent right now they're someone who's undeserving or incapable of taking care of their children we don't have the ability the, the cognitive infrastructure i like to say to connect these things in ways that allows us to 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 really have this wrap around approach and this kind of holistic uh, 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 analysis, analytical uh, 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 schema, right? And so anyway, I say all of that to say, you know, I think it's really, really important that we, you know, just kind of recognize that so much of this work is interrelated. And I tell people anti-racism work is anti-trafficking work. Awesome. Um, so we're getting a little close to the time of before we got to ask questions. So does, um, um, I would love to hear, um, I guess, some, some kind of, I don't want to say closing remarks, but some things that you might want to um, express that you have not able to do um, uh, during the first 40 minutes. All right. <laughs> So um, once again, I just want to reiterate, uh, you know, thank you to End Slavery Now, to National Underground Railroad Freedom Center, to Sarah, Chris, Jackie, thank you for having us in this conversation. It's, it's so, so important. It's an honor for me to be with these two ladies here today because I've learned a lot. So, um, <clears throat> but I will tell you, um, I think I look at it almost like the three P's that we always talk about, the protection, you know, prosecution and prevention, right? And so in terms of laws, I think definitely addressing you know labor laws and policies for example here in the us to better offer protection for workers and everything i mean there's harbor laws that we should be looking at um addressing child marriage here in the us kind of look at what the underpinnings look like systemic you know things that we should be uh looking at through through the legal system and the judicial system um you know laws can always be made better you know, and I think that's what we should continue to do. Um, following that, I think of that in prosecution and it, you know, it's enforceability of the law because I think we can have a million laws but we need to be, we need to have that will to enforce the law, number one. And number two, the accountability, um, definitely through the law but for ourselves. And I think that's what we dip down into sort of the prevention aspect, right? So awareness, yes but there's a culture shift that needs to happen. Um, and it does include having uncomfortable, very sensitive conversations. Um, and I feel like that's where that dialogue needs to come in and self-reflection, where am I, how am I contributing to this? Uh, thought, action, what within where I'm at, where I'm at. Because I think we often think about India or wherever it may be. It's right here. It's in our backyard. And it's, you know, Florida, Ohio, wherever you are, it's happening. So I think we have to go a little bit deeper now in terms of, you know, how we think about ourselves through dignity lenses. And I think framework of human rights, I'm a big advocate for that because I think it's you know, I think Regine was talking about, you know, sometimes trafficker, I mean, I'm sorry, human trafficking victims or survivors don't know that they're survivors of the crime. They don't know what their rights are, you know, as a human being, um, regardless of where you are, whether you're a foreign national or domestic, you know, here and domestically. Um, and I think, you know, looking at education, you know, school age appropriate education from an early state. I know some states are addressing this already, um, but I think we need to look at what that, what that entails. Um, and addressing vulnerabilities and root causes, you know, from discrimination and prejudicial, you know, attitudes, behaviors, um, you know, systems, what it looks like in the home, addressing things like poverty, you know, food insecurity, things that will drive somebody to that vulnerable state of where it may tip into a trafficking situation. And last and certainly not least, and maybe this should have been at the top, empowering survivors, because they're, they're the experts, you know, in, in, this, in this space. Um, so I think that voice um, and I know there's a lot of organizations that are starting to really kind of take that voice, um, you know, make that voice louder. Um, because again, those are the real experts that have so much that we can learn from. So I, I give them really the platform and everything that, that I continue to do. And thank you. Rashaya or Regine? Sure. I, will always, I will always concede to Rashaya. You, you, you go ahead. <laughs> um, 
Yeah. So I, I just would say, you know, disrupting these patterns, one requires awareness that there is a pattern, a problematic pattern in the first place. Right. So like, um, you know, I, I think Abby's done a great job of kind of really emphasizing the point that this can happen to anyone, but everyone isn't equally represented in the voices and the imagery uh, that we use to talk about this uh, uh, in the public spaces. Right. That's a problem. Uh, uh, that's absolutely a problem. And so it requires an awareness, one, that a problem exists. It requires us to cultivate our knowledge and skills uh, in these other areas as well. And that means cultivating our knowledge and skills uh, in our language tools and our historicized context to be able to talk about the ways in which these other dynamics impede upon, uh, I'm sorry, yes, impend upon, impinge, impinge is the right word, impinge upon uh, and animate, right, some, some of our uh, existing conditions, right? So you need to be comfortable talking about racial nuance. You need to have competency talking about racial nuance. Uh, you need to understand how racial nuance is animating the anti-trafficking space, right? And you also need to have a level of humility. I cannot tell you how many times I learned something so valuable from communities I'm not part of, right? They teach me and share things with me, insights that I never would have thought about. Uh, and so having that humility, being willing and believing that people who are different from you, that people who have different lived experiences than you have something valuable to add to you, to you, right? Not to necessarily to the work, but you have something to learn. You can benefit, uh, I think is really, really important. Uh, um, and then I also want to say, I think one of the problems with the um, anti-trafficking space is that we rely too heavily on the carceral state. Um, I think it's really, really important for us to explore other kinds of partnerships and or demand that our law enforcement partners uh, implement a racial equity lens uh, in the work that they're doing, because we know that crimes aren't prosecuted equally. Right. We know that there are some people who are disproportionately uh, uh, more likely to uh, be prosecuted, to be charged, to be investigated, et cetera. And so um, if we're committed to this work, we have to integrate this work into all of the various partnerships that we have and all the various initiatives we support. And that requires requiring our that requires requiring our law enforcement partners to use a racial equity lens in the work that they're doing and being able to measure and being comfortable. They need to be comfortable navigating these spaces as well. So those were the only two things I would add. Um, oh, go ahead, Virginie. I Very quickly, I, I, I really wanted to emphasize um, a big portion of our advocacy has to do with opening, opening ourselves to humanizing our, our clients, our peers, our community members way more than we already are. Um, at least in the criminal justice system, lawyers can be, um, we're basically the storytellers for our clients. We have to present their story to the court to get ultimate results. What I've been finding more and more is this desire to have this perfect victim, this um, person who they went through these trials and tribulations, they came out on top, is this perfect freedom story, glory, fireworks, Hollywood story. That's not how it is most of the time. And it's very, very difficult. It's very alienating for my clients to have to kind of soften the problematic behaviors, the stuff that they had to do to survive that may not have been ideal. Um, in order to highlight those glorious moments of their story. This is so difficult. This is very alienating to survivors. Um, many of my survivor clients have said no to, to getting legal things done for them because they don't want to go through this process. They don't want to go through somebody saying, well, why did you do that? Like you could have gotten out. So we're in situations where how much do we actually want to support and empower and help survivors? without putting them in boxes that are convenient for us, that are comfortable for us, or that make us feel good about us extending our, our mercifulness or our leniency toward them. So I, I would say anybody in any field, any walks of life that are, that are trying to get involved, try to get more um, informed about this, um, try to keep as much of an open mind as possible about what your survivor, what your victim looks like, because you might not like what that person went through, what they did to survive, who they involved on their journey to survive. Um, and that is just the un unfortunate reality of what we're experiencing. It's a complex and very black and very gray crime phenomenon that people experience. So if you're waiting to have that beautiful Hollywood story, and if that's the only thing that's being plastered in the media, you are going to push people more on the margin margins. They're not gonna come to my office. They're not gonna try to get the benefits that they deserve and they're entitled to. So. Um, if we can keep humanizing survivors, if we can empower them to speak their truth without us damning them to hell, basically, um, that's where I, I hope that this this path takes us so we can ultimately have better advocacy for people.
Yeah, I think mo from what I saw in the uh, questions in the chat is basically, you know, what can I do as a regular person? What can I physically do, you know, to help? So if any, you know, any one of you can, you know, answer that question, I mean, that's what basically the questions in the um, chat boils down to. Come on, guys. <laughs> I, I mean, we've already, I think we've already given a lot of, you know, I think so much of what we've said, it's not, I think people want like some one thing that they can go out and do that they'll see make an immediate difference. And I wish I had a one thing for you like that. I wish I had a how to, uh, uh, you know, but I think we're all smart enough to follow how to's. Uh, this isn't a how to kind of space, right? This is the kind of space that you have to, you know, um, spend some time in, it's a process. I mean, so much of what Virginia just said, I, I, I hope you saw me emphatically nodding my head because that more than anything is probably one of the biggest impediments is that people just don't feel safe with you. Not you as a person, but like you as the anti-trafficking movement. They don't feel like you understand. They don't feel like you're actually invested. They feel like you're invested in a version of what happened to them, the version you are most comfortable with, the version you are most passionate about. Um, and I think that you know, really, really spending time with that, having some introspection about that, learning and educating yourself, both in informal spaces like this and with experts, but also like Gabby said, with the, with the survivor community, listening to their stories, uh, really, really empathizing. I, I love Brene Brown's um, uh, comment, right? That, that empathy begins when you're able to appreciate the experience as they experienced it, not as you think they experienced it, not as you expect them to experience it, right? And so much of, of this is that. And there's no quick, easy one way to do that. That that requires a level of um, and a commitment to this constant process of revision, revising yourself, revising your approach, revising your thoughts, revising, you know, your knowledge base, right? And that's just an ongoing commitment as you do this work. And I think just pro approaching this work with humility and a commitment to the work and to the them, right? Into into not to yourself or your own interests. I just, you know, I can't overstate that. There's not an easy how to to do that, but I think that those are some of the really, really important sentiments that you approach this work with that make a difference, that make survivors or people who are experiencing these things, people who've been in trafficking situations feel safe and want to come to you. Actually, I have a question. Um, so I recently read that someone was arrested for sex trafficking at a, um, at a football, you know, like a pro football game. So that that like I might I guess the reason why I'm asking that question is like can you expound on like I guess you would say spaces that you would but pe people like me who don't do this work would not know that that this happens like a football game I'm like a pro football game how how's that you know how is that possible so if you can just you know expound on that on like spaces that you know you would think that would not be um, a space for, in, you know, for that, for, you know, for that crime? Well, I, I would first say um, we, we always need to differentiate between voluntary sex work and sex trafficking. Um, there is a difference. And I know in, in some place like Ohio, it's, it's hard to wrap our mind around that. What do you mean? Voluntary sex work, grab my pearls, but that is a thing. So um, I think it's really important that we also keep in mind when we have these stories that, um, we shouldn't necessarily take voluntary sex work and clump it with like a human trafficking victimization because it might not be the same thing. So that was just kind of my little footnote to your question. Sure. Um, but uh, I'm at OJPC. I, I don't believe in hypercriminalization. So uh, I, I would want to pass the mic off to my fellow panelists. But um, those are the stories that we hear in the media. And oftentimes that can be harmful to not only trafficking survivors, but also those who do engage in voluntary sex work, um, it can make a dangerous situation for them as well. So just kind of putting that caveat out there. I would push back and say, what about the space makes you think it can't happen there, right? That's one of those confrontation moments, right? That where you have to do some, some of that, you know, kind of introspection. What have you internalized about this space that suggests to you that somehow it's outside the realm of traffic. I don't think there is a space, right? I don't think that there is a space, the White House, the alley, 
all of it is susceptible as far as I'm concerned, right? Like, I would hope it's not. I would hope there aren't people being trafficked in the White House. But I also don't think that there's something special about the White House that, that you know, removes it outside the space of it. So, I, you know, it's one of those things that I would push back on. Yeah, and I would say, I mean, I think we have to be careful of the sensationalism around it, too, um, right. and not to fall into this rhetoric and conspiracy theories. I mean, I know um, incredible organizations that are now spending ridiculous amount of resources and time trying to dispel some of these theories that are floating out there, car seats. And, you know, I mean, it's just, it, it's mind boggling. And I think there's no one space that trafficking happens. So it's not like, you know, make a line here so that you can be trafficked or, mm -hmm. you know, that you're out shopping all of a sudden, you know, like the movie Taken. I mean, it is wonderful, but there is a very small chance of that happening. Um, and it's a good movie and it does happen. Um, but I think it's like, we have to understand that actually the majority of the trafficking survivors are victims know their trafficker in some way or capacity. So um, they're familiar, in fact, families actually make up a big portion of traffickers. Um, so we have to understand that there, it can happen anywhere to anyone. It is more in the how it happens, why it's happening more than at a location. So I think mm -hmm. that those are things that we need to, and if, if, if really, if there's a fear, if there's a fear in you that you don't know what's happening, Go to, let me give you a plug, you know, polaris.org and look at what trafficking is. Go and read up the Palermo Protocol if you want to be familiar with international law. Um, the TVPA, which is our main document here in the United States. Um, there, so you can get familiar with what, what it actually is legally, what it looks like, what the, th the, 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 the elements that we look for in the actual crime, um, as opposed to going to, I don't know, media, a social media venture. And actually, and Slavery Now has a great resource of, I think, organizations that you can easily click to to get that information but I think getting informed and maybe the awareness is already there so now go a little bit deeper as to what does it really mean and the data where are you getting your facts and your data from mm -hmm. um, as to what the trafficking is looks like and where it's actually happening um, and then it uh, and then I think the third thing is looking at yourself right so what is it that you may be doing and you maybe find something from all that reading that you'll do uh, or listening to these webinars you know this is a great place to be because you are going to get something hopefully that you can take with you and grow with you know even that question that Jackie posed you know let me think through some of these things that I've heard um, mm -hmm. kind of put it through your own critical thinking and analysis you know of what that means in the space um, and instead of operating out of fear operated with education and openness and you know like Rashara said hum humility to kind of look oh my gosh am I buying this and is this potentially something that's fueling a labor trafficking situation those are the things that if you really want to make a difference I'm wearing blue it's beyond wearing the blue it's beyond today it's year round so I'll, I'll kind of get a little passionate there, but <laughs> thank you for the question. <laughs> yeah, um, so I have one more question before. Um, it says, who do we contact if we suspect a situation? And I think um, there's been answered, but I definitely would like to hear um, um, anyone on the panel. It gave the resources I was going to give. I, I've uh, they will talk you through. They will ask you questions. I will kind of help to to screen whatever it is you think you saw. Um, but also, many places uh, have task force now. Um, you know, if you if you'd like to rely on law enforcement or if not law enforcement, uh, have organizations within the community. I always really really suggest people contact local organizations, grassroots organizations doing this work. Often those those uh, uh, spaces em employ survivors, which is amazing. Um, um, they also have people who are connected and accountable to these communities, uh, such that uh, uh, the chance of re-traumatization, they also have people who are trauma informed, um, who know how to be trauma responsive, right? Because you know we we have some harmful tactics that we believe help. <laughs> You know, and and you know, we have a habit of of using harmful strategies to help, and and so these grassroots organizations are just less likely to do that. So I always encourage people to seek out grassroots organizations within their community, as opposed to um, using some of the maybe larger, more national or um, more state-sanctioned, uh, uh, state-funded uh, uh, resources. Um, but in addition to that, though, I know some of the websites that Gabby mentioned, Polaris, and Slavery Now, they all have resources on their website. 
I mean, it depends on where you are, but I mean, love 146. I mean, there are tons of organizations that will give you some great resources about where to look, who to talk to, how to get more information. Awesome. So it is now four o'clock. So I want to um, thank our distinguished guest um, for, you know, bringing some great knowledge about um, this subject. I, I want to thank also to all the uh, the person, all the people who attended. Um, thanks for the questions, and um, you know, uh, also just to, and, you know, I think the, um, I think all the websites to the uh, to each individual panelist has been in the chat, um, and then also we also the Freedom Center has a wonderful, um, uh, very informative exhibit in Slavery Now, and then also, and we also have a companion. Uh, website um, companion uh, piece on our website, uh, freedomcenter.org. So again, thank you so much. Oh, first, oh, secondly, the webinar will be available because uh, it's being recorded and it'll be available within the next seven to 10, uh, sen the next se seven to 10 days. So again, thank you so much for um, your, your, your breadth of information. And um, I learned something new myself. So thank you very much and have a great evening.